Bonjour à Good day to everyone. I hope that you're doing well this morning. So, good morning from Montreal and welcome to this first day of the IUHP World Conference on Health Promotion and the theme is Public Policies for Health, Wellbeing and Equity. Montreal and welcome to the 24th IUHPE World Conference on Health Promotion. As you all know, the theme is promoting policies for health, well-being and equity. Buenos. So good day from Montreal and welcome to the 24th IUHPE World Conference on Health Promotion with the theme of promoting policies for health, well-being and equity. So welcome to this first plenary which is talking about seizing opportunities with all of the current changes. I like of the themes, but in particular this one, it really is a call for health. Before we jump right into the subject, if you need any technical assistance during the plenary or throughout the conference, please turn to the technical team via the platform. So. On the left at the bottom, you've got an icon so that you can talk with someone from technical assistance. So that was on the technical side of things. I'd also like to take time to give some thanks to all of our sponsors and partners on behalf of the organisations, which mean that we've been able to organise this conference, in particular, the Ministry of Health and Social Services and the Public Health Agency of Canada. And please look up the tab partners and sponsors to know more about our sponsors. We'd also like to thank the many volunteers who've got involved in communities. There's many people who've been working this for almost three years in order to be able to produce this conference for you. And there's over 200 revisers who revised the over 200 submissions that we received, all of these abstracts. So many people have been committed to this. And of course, we thank everyone who is coming to share their expertise and the fruit of their work and reflections with us. We've got a great variety of activities ahead of us. So as I said earlier this morning, for those who were not already connected, please do use the chat box of the plenary to show that you're here, tell us where you come from. That way other participants know who else is here and that adds some human warmth to the virtual experience. So the first subject, breaking news, seizing opportunities within the current changes. Basically, we're seeing how can we consider the promises and opportunities of disruptions and tipping points. So a window of opportunity for health promotion, whether we're talking about climate change, ecological disruption, geopolitical shifts, social unrest, or uh, technological uh, developments or pandemics. There have been several international movements in the last year, such as Black Lives Matter, Fridays for Future, who have renewed international attention to gender equity, racism and colonialism. So having said that, in spite of all of these movements, uh, health promotion and health education continues to largely focus on individuals or rather than focusing on the shortcomings of our policy approaches. So that's why we're looking at public policies. And in this first uh, plenary, we will be able to hear from uh, fierce defenders of causes such as those who defend Indigenous children's rights, feminist liberation and well-being as a policy driver. Each of the speakers come from the artistic and the academic world. They've got varied profiles, but they're all very much involved in interventions that are promising for justice and equity. So the first speaker, we're very fortunate to have her here with us in person, and it's Cindy Blackstock, who's a member of the Gitscan First Nation, and she is the Pride Executive Director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. She's also a professor at McGill University School of Social Work here in Montreal, and she has over 30 years of experience working in child welfare and Indigenous children's rights. And she was in, involved in a human rights challenge with First Nations about Canada's inequitable provision of child and family services and also failure to implement Jordan's principle. So she's been a real leader 
with this file and it's led to hundreds of thousands of services now being provided to First Nations children, youth and families. The title of her presentation is Loving Justice Beyond Reports, The Negotiating Tables and Roadblocks. And her presentation will be followed by a presentation from Colectivo Las Tesis, which is an artistic, interdisciplinary and feminist women's collective from Valparaiso in uh, Chile. And then finally, we will also have a talk from Anna Matheson, who is a lecturer in health policies at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. And throughout the talks, please put your questions in the chat box. And we've got a team here who will be in charge of giving us a summary of all of these comments in the question and answer period after the three presentations. You'll be able to vote for the questions that you're most interested in so that we can give priority to the questions that interest most of the audience. So now I'll give the floor to Cindy Blackstock for her presentation. Here on Haudenosaunee territory and on a day when all of us can make a difference. You know, as we're fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, we're dealing with another pandemic of systemic racism that is flooding across the country. But the good news is there's something we can do about it if we're prepared to stand in the winds of the discrimination that too often piles up on the hopes and dreams and lives of people all over the globe. You know, this last weekend, we saw a shooter in Buffalo taking the lies of persons who were just in a grocery store. It wasn't a lone wolf. It's fed by the systemic discrimination that has been woven into the fabric of too many countries. Now, I am a First Nations person, and when we look at Canada, there are many good things about it, but it is actually a very stark colonial country. It still has a racist Indian Act. It still gives First Nations children and families less public services and fewer public services than everybody else. And yet the negotiating strategies we've used, the reports, the roadblocks, they haven't really resulted in the type of substantive change that is needed to end what really are apartheid public services. So one of the realizations I had to come to very early on, and this is not to dismiss the importance of research, but it is to acknowledge that the problem of this long-standing pattern of the Canadian government choosing to say to First Nations children that you are not worth the money was not in existence because they didn't know the answer. Decades of reports had piled up showing the inequality, showing how they could be fixed, showing the harms that resulted from First, to First Nations children, including their deaths and driven into those graves in residential schools that hit the global headlines earlier this, uh, in 2021. The problem was is that we don't implement the solutions that are on the books. Instead, we go to official procedures. We have more research. We have more inquiries. We have more inquests that pile up the same recommendations that continue not to be changed. So how do we deal with that? Well, when I entered into the national scene in Canada in 1997, I was one of those people that believed the only reason that Canada could possibly be giving these kids less and that inequitable level of public services, coupled with the trauma of residential schools that only closed in 1996 in Canada, was driving more First Nations children into, chair, into child welfare care than at the height of those residential schools. I thought the only reason this could exist is because Canada didn't know it was giving First Nations children less, and it did not know how to fix it. I was wrong. But I work with other people and we came up with another solution. Then Canada welcomed it. They were at the table, but they said, oh no, we need a more specific report. Let's do another one. So we did it, made the mistake again. And in 2005, what we found is First Nations children were getting 70 cents on the dollar for support to recover from the trauma of residential schools and to keep their families together compared to non-Indigenous kids. Canada accepted that report, and then they did not implement it. That triggered a moral question in our minds. What are we prepared to put on the line to make sure that Canada does implement it? 
What do you do when you have a resistant state or a resistant multinational or a resistant NGO or a resistant society? How courageous are we prepared to be? Because the evidence was overwhelming. Well, we filed a human rights complaint along with the Assembly of First Nations in 2007. Canada took immediate action and that was to cut all of our funding. They also retaliated in a whole host of ways and they tried to get the case kicked out on procedural matters. But in 2016, the Canadian government was found in its own courts to be racially discriminating against these children by giving them less. And what did giving it less mean for these kids? It meant they were going into child welfare care at 19 times the rate of other kids. It meant that these kids were um, dying because they were being denied public services of other children. It meant that children, parents were making decisions about whether they would rewash catheter tubes for their critically ill children or would they just not toilet them at all. These were the, this is what this underfunding meant. Now, in 2015, the Canadian government acknowledged this legal ruling. In fact, they welcomed it, but then they didn't implement it, that same pattern again. So we've had to go through 21 non-compliance orders. But thankfully, as a result of that, First Nations children are now um, getting about uh, $40 billion more services than they otherwise would have received. But these are not a gift. This is not reconciliation. This is the achievement of basic human rights. So how did we get there? Well, first of all, we were taught by our elders that if you are gonna deal with injustice, you must do so from a basis of love and light. Now that might sound kind of frivolous, but it's absolutely essential and we're seeing it around the globe. You can do a, a social movement on the basis of hate and you can do a social movement on the basis of fear and misinformation and it will catch like wildfire. But what you end up with is the January 6th, or the convoy in Ottawa, or other types of hate movements that are too often around the world. We cannot devote ourselves to these tactics. We must use evidence to make sure we're doing right versus being right. We must make sure that we're not working ideologically and that we're open to critique and get better evidence. We must make sure that we are fueling and empowering people to be activists along with us in a movement that is meant to improve society. It's not about taking away from somebody else. It's actually about uplifting everybody by giving every child a chance. So I'm a First Nations girl. I grew up in a bush in northern BC. And in face of the Canadian government, I was thinking, how in the heck are we going to do this? We filed this human rights complaint. They cut all of our funding. We had $50,000 in the bank, and we were against the biggest legal firm in the country, the Department of Justice. The government of Canada then and now spends more money litigating against First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples than anybody else in the country. So how are we going to win? Because it wasn't about the Caring Society winning. It was about the kids winning. And a lot of people said to us at the time, you know, if you take on Canada, they're going to cut your funding and then you're going to dissolve as an organization and then who will be around to speak for First Nations children? Well, we had an elder who gave us a great piece of advice when we started. He said, never fall in love with the Caring Society. Never fall in love with your business card. Only fall in love with the children because there may come a day when you have to sacrifice both those things for them. And he was right. I mean, we exist because of them, for them. And I thought, you know, if the organization goes down, and it's likely it will because that's Canada's go-to strategy is pull all the funding as soon as you litigate against them. If they do that, then at least we'll have shown these kids that we love them enough to stand up for them. At least we have shown them that. Well. Given that I grew up in the bush, I decided I would look to the animals about how small things take on big entities and develop this strategy for advocacy that is for groups that have no money, very little experience, and are dealing with a large change-resistant uh, opponent in terms of addressing systemic discrimination. Now, it assumes that you documented the problem, 
that you have evidence-based solutions. It's not enough to complain. You actually have to have something to remedy the problem. Ensure that the government or the organization you are targeting has the resources. And the government is choosing not to make the change. Don't use the word failure. They are not failing. They are choosing not to implement the change. That's a different thing. Then you go to this mosquito advocacy technique. So mosquitoes, as we all know, are all over the globe. In fact, I've never been to one continent where they haven't been there, and they're enormously effective. They make our lives miserable. We spend all kinds of money on products, don't we, to get rid of them. But they're teeny tiny. Well, one of the first things they do is that they are very targeted. They're not buzzing around, wondering, wringing hands, wondering what they're going to do. They know exactly what they're after. And we need to be too. We need to look at what is the actual causal problem that we could bring to public attention that would have maximum benefit for people. Because you get one shot at the public. So don't go for a symptom. I could have been advocating for the overrepresentation of young people amongst uh, suicide or the overrepresentation of young people in incarceration. But by going to the idea of equity, which is the closest thing we have to a silver bullet, we could actually have long and wide sweeping positive outcomes for these kids. The other thing is have an infectious message. Mosquitoes infect, that's how we do it. And when you're a small, teeny tiny group or one person, you need other allies. So make sure that you're framing your message properly. Look at George Lakoff's book, uh, Don't Think of an Elephant, which was a real uh, uh, mind shifter for me. Because what I was doing with Canada is I was arguing against them and I was taking up their language. But what Lakoff as a linguist, he tells us that by taking up their language, you're actually reinforcing their message, even if you're arguing against it. That's why the title of his book is Don't Think of an Elephant. If I asked you all to think of an animal, but no one think of an elephant, you can't help it. So what we need to do is develop a frame of a message that's seated seated in deep human values. So at the Caring Society, we want to raise a generation of First Nations kids who get a fair chance to grow up safely with their families, be healthy, get a good education, and be proud of who they are. Your message should be able to be understood by four-year-olds and know it's important. You gotta build a swarm. Too many of us come to conferences with the same people all the time. We even, we call them networking conferences, but we'll actually go with the same group that we have from work because no one's afraid, to, everyone's afraid of going to a workshop by themselves. Well, our elders told me, no more social work conferences because if social work could solve this, it'd already be solved. You need to go into places where no one knows who you are. And you need to enter those spaces with the message from the children, but also with an opportunity for those people to make a difference. And not something that costs money. Too many NGOs go out and say, you know, can you make a donation? But what we really want to do is engage all people in being active citizens and change. So we have seven free ways to make a difference in under two minutes on our website that is available for children themselves, adults, seniors, and then you bring people together and you infect that way. You swarm, you don't have a day of action, you have 365 days of action. That's what you need to do. And you also need to bite, you need a peaceful binding strategy. That means litigation, it could mean public uh, pressure, it has to be something that will involuntarily make that actor change their mind. But it has to start with moral courage. And the question has to be asked is how courageous are we? Because if we look at the systemic discrimination that is unfolding around the world, the truth is we already know how to deal with it. But how many of us are really prepared to stand in the winds of that discrimination? How many of us are prepared to put our organizations or our professions on the line so that we can stand against powerful actors? Now, this whole question of moral, practice, uh, moral courage takes practice. We talk about advocacy, but we don't talk about courage or sacrifice, and that's wrong. So there's a great YouTube channel you can check out on moral courage with vignettes of people of all walks of life. And the reason that we're not morally courageous is because we think that if we are courageous, if we take a stand, that somehow someone's going to come for us, and that will be a huge risk. 
So it's almost like a, it's a kind of a, although we want to do the right thing, we're scared what the personal consequences are. And I get that. I understand that. But the reality is, is that we have to come to a place where we understand that we have a duty and an obligation to the public and that we have to have as professionals the moral courage to stand in the winds of discrimination so they don't have to do it alone. Equity is the magic bullet. We all know that in this audience. If you can link it to equity, you're going to be far further ahead. So culturally based equity is really what we're doing here. And that is the first domino solution. Go for the cause, not for the symptoms. Here's the thing about framing. If you don't, aren't very good about framing your messages, then there's the Frameworks Institute. You can go and check out this organization and get ideas about how to frame your cause. Everything from persons who are incarcerated to um, ab abortion issues that are unfolding in the United States for all the women. It's like rolling back the clock. All that kind of stuff is available there. And the other thing we have to think about is how mind control or undue influence has limited our view of what the actual advocacy responses are that we have are available. This is the work of Stephen Hassan. He wrote The Cult of Trump in the United States. And his work is actually having a lot of influence now as we're seeing QAnon and other movements, but also systemic racism and colonialism unfolding around the world. And the basic idea here is that you take an individual who is free thinking and you apply undue influence and then you actually shift their identity. This happens sometimes in bureaucracies as well, which is one of my theories about why so many bureaucracies do wrong things, is people supplant their own ethical guidelines for the loyalty to the organization. And that becomes the rule of the day. And that, in that name, so much damage is done. So this is just more of his work about how you unfreeze identities using social media. And we need to be much more savvy in the health equity area about social media, but using it in a positive way, not in the toxic potion that we see unfolding around the world. Now, you know, um, I work with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit young people. And remember the elder's advice about uh, who are you going to fall in love with? Well, I fall in love with them. But then the question is, how am I accountable to them? And the best way to find that out is to ask them. And they, uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit young people came together to write this report about accountability. Not only about accountability of governments, accountability of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit governments, but accountability of people like me and accountability of people like you. And so one of the things that they always said is implement the existing reports. Don't come talking to us, asking us what we think when you have not done what we've already told you. And I think that's fair. We got to show them that we, they, they can trust us. Of course, we all know about the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. It has not been codified in many Western countries, and it ought to be, because it safeguards peaceful and respectful human rights defenders who are morally courageous, and there are many examples around the world. This is an important thing that ought to be pursued by NGOs globally, and uh, of course, uh, you know, the protection of journalists as well, and the important work that they're doing. Here's an organization that's there for you. If you are being persecuted in your human rights defending, or if you know of other people who are, Frontline Defenders actually came to my uh, support because Canada uh, retaliated against me. They actually deployed over just about 200 public servants to follow my personal movements and online stuff to try and get the case thrown out on vexatious and frivolous grounds. And what you want to do during that time is you have to expect that they're going to do that but you have to respond in a way that brings honor to the children. The moment you become the victim, Canada's won. And Frontline Defenders is a very sophisticated human rights organization that's there to help you so that you're able to leverage it in a way that brings light to the injustice that you sacrifice so much for. 
Bringing in children is key. Raising a new generation of non-Indigenous kids who know the history of this country, who can be trusted with the truth, and more than that, are equipped with basic human rights activism skills from the earliest stages so that they can look around and see there's somebody from the LGBTQI communities being discriminated against. I'm going to stand with them. There's someone from the Black Lives Matter uh, movement who's being discriminated. I'm going to stand with them. There's someone who is from the Jewish community or the Muslim community who's being discriminated. I'm going to stand with them. We cannot just leave it until their 18th birthday and the voting rights. We have to do more with that. And so we've developed all kinds of resources to teach children and engage children. And they've actually taught us a lot about how to do advocacy well. Because kids, when they're confronted with an injustice, see it clearly. And they don't strike committees or wring hands. They actually do something about it. I'm going to end with a letter. When we were in the middle of the case, and many of our NGO partners actually didn't want too much to deal with us because they're too afraid we're being too political, to which I said, we absolutely, we're being political, but we're not being partisan. And we were particularly seen as being political because children were filling the courtrooms of this, this highly uh, charged litigation. They had come to see what was going on. And when there were so many children in the courtroom and they couldn't fit in, they went outside and they brought letters to the government. They wanted the government to know how it felt to see one of their First Nations brothers or sisters or other community members being given less. And there's a letter written by a little boy, his name is Harry, and he said this, Dear Prime Minister, do you have a cat? I have a cat. His name is Micah, and he's a boy, and he's black. I like rocks, so that's why I named him that. He said, do you want to create a crime wave and lose all of your money? Because if you give First Nations kids less money for school, they're not going to be able to get the jobs they want when they get bigger. And then they're still going to need money to live, so they're going to have crooks invading people's homes. And people in the community are going to get mad because of this. And he looks down on his paper and he says, my teacher tells me you're in charge. So you better man up and build more schools. Love, Harry. You know, there is more evidence in that one child's letter than there is in most doctoral dissertations. <laughs> and in there we see the end though. It's love, Harry. We cannot be tempted into the dark space of igniting social movements on the basis of hate and fear. And we need not do that either. We've seen examples around the globe historically where love, truth, justice, and a real commitment to courage and wisdom can really see the light forward. So with that, I want to thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity, and I'm really looking forward to seeing our next speaker. Cindy Blockstone, you have set us on fire. <laughs> You're putting us on a journey. Thank you. Thank you. I have the honor of introducing the next speakers. Collecto, Collectivo Las Thesis is an artistic interdisciplinary Feminist Women's Collective in Valparaiso, Chile. It is composed of four dynamic women that are dedicated to disseminating feminist theory through performance. They combine performing arts with sound, graphic and textile design, history and social sciences to make their case. They're known for creating a piece of work entitled A Rapist in Your Way, which denounces the harm that was caused by patriarchy and social violence in Chile during the 2019 social uprising. This performance has been widely shared on social media and translated in over 50 languages. In 2020, Time Magazine 
named him as one of the most influential people. Unfortunately, they will not be able to join us live, but what we do have are their performances to share with you. Nos roban todo, menos la rabia. 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 Confinadas al pedo de lo doméstico y en el bucle del hogar. Es este el lugar más peligroso donde puedo estar. Al tedio de lo doméstico y en el bucle del hogar. Es este el lugar más peligroso donde puedo estar. Hoy se quema el velo de la violencia. Se cocinan las heridas inscritas en nuestros cuerpos. De pronto nos encontramos a la intemperie dentro de nuestro propio hogar.
Today, we are sinking fear, is the title. Together, we chase away fear. Together, we support one another. Together, we sink oppression. Together, we will get across. This is then repeated. without freedom, without equality, there are no rights nor dignity. Go back to whence you came. Today we are sinking fear. Without freedom, without equality, there are no rights nor dignity. Go back to whence you came. Today we are sinking fear. This then repeated. Article 1 of the former Chilean Constitution. Persons are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Family is the fundamental unit of society. The state recognizes and protects the intermediate groups through which society organizes and structures itself and guarantees them the necessary autonomy to comply with their own specific purposes. The state is at the service of the human person and its end is to promote the common good for which it must help to create the social conditions which may allow each and every one of the members of the national community the greatest spiritual and material realisation possible with total respect for the rights and guarantees that this constitution establishes. It is the duty of the state to safeguard national security, to give protection to the population and the family, to endorse the strengthening of the latter, to promote the harmonised integration. Thank you. 
people that face this. We have just experienced Collectivo Lestasis. We have just experienced the power of imagery and sound. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Daphne. And thank you, Safila. The next speaker is Anna Matheson. She's a researcher and teacher in the School of Health at Teharanga Waka, Victoria University in Wellington, in New Zealand. Her focus of work is understanding how complex systems thinking can aid and help in the knowledge of taking societal action that is needed to reverse and address inequality and improve health and well being. For the past 15 years, She's been listening to community and policy perspectives on what constrains and facilitates local action to achieve these goals. As a result of her work, she's currently leading evaluation of a Healthy Families New Zealand initiative. It's a community-led project that focuses on health and well-being from a policy angle to look at how does one strengthen prevention systems in 10 localities. In her talk with us, she's going to share her experiences, addressing the topic specifically, reorienting health and policy systems to achieve well-being for all. The experience in Andorra, New Zealand. We now will have Anna Matheson joining us live. Thank you very much. And I have to just say before I begin, um, that's a bit tough. It's a bit tough coming on the heels of Cindy and that video. <laughs> so, um, you know, I hope, I hope that what I have to say um, uh, is still resonates and is of interest. Uh, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Greetings to you all. Um, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to talk and participate alongside these wonderful, inspiring women. This conference is such a special occasion uh, to discuss and reflect with the global health promotion community. Um, yep, I'm Anna Matheson, and it's currently um, one in the morning for me. Um, I'm in uh, Wellington, which is a beautiful and wild coastal city in the capital of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, I work at the School of Health at Te Heringa Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. Um, before I begin my talk, I would like to acknowledge Te Tiriti o Waitangi, and that's the treaty between Indigenous Māori and British colonial settlers, which was signed in 1840. It's considered our founding document, and my own career has been influenced by the need to honour the treaty through partnership and recognising the need for self-determination. And I'm heartened that um, in Aotearoa at present, we're having a passionate revival of Māori knowledge, language and governance systems. So my aim tonight is to talk mostly about opportunities and solutions. I'm so mindful of the narratives around the current problems we face that often leave people with a sense of a paralysis about what can be done. But first I will talk about a problem for a little bit and how I've grown to understand health inequality amongst the evidence that we have here in New Zealand. So more and more, you might be coming across or using the ideas of complex systems thinking. So understanding that our social systems behave in literally complex ways has been gaining momentum. And I say literally here, because when something is complex, it's not only complicated or difficult to understand, instead being complex is a feature of systems where relationships are central to the way that outcomes are produced. The health system, for example, is both complicated and complex, 
but it is its complexity that drives health inequality. The pandemic illustrated this clearly, shining a bright light in our underlying systems and their predictable behavior. And I'll talk more about this in a minute. In 1972, uh, 50 years ago, and I also have to say the year that I was born, um, Donella Meadows and the Club of Rome um, published a prescient report called The Limits to Growth. By using systems modeling techniques, this group of scientists were able to demonstrate how unbridled economic growth was on a trajectory unsustainable for Earth's finite resources. Although you could argue the detail, the modeling suggested we would breach planetary limits sometime this century. Of course, uh, what we're now seeing with climate change and other planetary systems such as biodiversity, the warning about growth is proving accurate. Yet still growth is lauded and aspired to by many. So this is a phenomenon all too familiar, where despite ev evidence and knowledge and lots of it, we're recreating patterns of outcomes that are bad for most of us on earth. We see this clearly with health inequality. In New Zealand, by the late 1970s, we knew we had a significant socioeconomic gradient in health outcomes. So that's where people who are poorer have worse health outcomes than people who are richer. We also um, have known that inst institutional racism compounds this pattern for some ethnic groups, especially indigenous Māori and Pacific people. So we've known for 50 years, well, almost 50 years of these unfair and intolerable differences in health between groups, including what's causing them. But over the last several years, a series of high level reviews and reports have reflected on our health and welfare systems. And they've all found that we've actually made very little progress on inequality during this time, despite our knowledge and despite attempts to address it. Uh, we're still struggling with how to effectively deliver services locally, and we have not done well at tackling the social determinants of health. Our most recent household economic survey showed our already high income inequality in New Zealand had become higher. And this is in a context um, globally where the UN's reported that runaway inequality is destabilizing democracies. And then the pandemic came and uh, laid bare these unfair systems for everyone to see. Although in New Zealand we've been, we were mostly successful at keeping COVID from spreading in the early days, undoubtedly saving lives, the health, social and economic consequences have still fallen unequally, showing us just how fragile our systems are for many people and setting up health trajectories for some groups projected to worsen in the longer term. So the world is a complex, interconnected, finite, ecological, social, psychological, economic system. We treat it as if it were not, as if it were divisible, separable, simple and infinite. Our persistent and tractable global problems arise directly from this mismatch. <clears throat> so back to Donella Meadows for a minute. As well as the Limits to Growth report, she's written influentially on system behavior, but she died too young and before she could really demonstrate the full value of systems thinking for social systems and especially how we can alter emergent outcomes. But she left behind important building blocks for others. So the evidence we now have of health inequality, which casts it as an emergent property, adds more to this picture. This picture, which was clearly drawn by the WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health in 2008, when it concluded that most of health is created in the places we're born, play, live, work, and age. And so it is for health that the interconnections that Donella refers to come together most profoundly locally. In complex systems terms, this is because of sensitivity to initial conditions, or you might know it as the butterfly effect at work. But we know this, don't we? Especially those of us working in um, health promotion. We've had decades of global movements, including Alma Ata, Health for All, and the Ottawa Charter, 
calling for change in health systems and for them to become more integrated and more focused on people and communities, as well as on settings, environments, participation and policies. We know that successful action on health requires joining up sectors as well as joining up communities. Whole of government and intersectoral action have been with us for a long time in New Zealand, but we've not, but have not been successful. Not only failing at connecting, but where we've tried to devolve decision making to communities, this has uh, often led to its devaluing instead of a strengthening of control and voice. Our policy system has been dogged with implementation failure and an inability to put what we know into action. Organization at the top has continued to take the lion's share of resources, frequently suffering its own disestablishment before any impact can reach those on the ground. The pandemic gave us insight into this lack of resilience and a need for greater sophistication in how we treat our local systems. But it also made obvious how important local community, community and provider organizations are for getting stuff done, yet they still have a precarious existence. And it showed that if we changed incentive and, and practices, organizations could indeed work with each other and resources could be found and used where needed very quickly. The pandemic lessons resonated strongly with things that I've noticed of policy and community relationships over my career. First, we don't seem to think that, com that communities need effective organization. This is seen clearly in the main ways that we invest, which are often through competitive and siloed strategies. Second, policy solutions within communities often don't treat them as if they have pre-existing contexts. So little attention is given to what's already going on. Third, community actors are frequently more stable over time than policy actors. The health sector in New Zealand has been in a state of almost constant reform, meaning continual changes in people and priorities and a loss, and loss, of, loss of institutional knowledge. And I often refer to this as policy, policy behaving like a goldfish in terms of its memory. And finally, it's very difficult to get even small material changes made in some communities. Housing is an example where we've known for years that insulation and heating is good for health, yet much of our housing stock remains cold and damp. But I've been fortunate over the last seven years to be leading uh, an evaluation of an initiative to prevent chronic disease and improve well-being, which is trying to do things differently. So guided by evidence, equity and systems change methods, local teams and 10 place-based communities are building on and connecting what's already going on to make local environments healthier. They're doing amazing work, projects to improve relationships among service providers, growing places for kids to play, promoting local voices in urban planning, advocating for smoke-free, safe alcohol and healthy food policies, building more resilient food systems and restoring local narratives that re reconnect social and natural histories. An important enabler of this local action has been the team's relationships with policy people. These relationships have been untraditional. So they've been close and they've been timely, reciprocal and responsive honest about values and careful about trust building with the sharing of power being made explicit. But this is still only one small pocket of better community and policy relations and spreading this practice more widely is proving hard. The mindset that community action is a soft, unscientific vehicle for change is pervasive and it obscures the rigorous methods needed to act effectively. But I am seeing a groundswell of local innovation happening in New Zealand geared towards improving well-being. And there's been a turn to thinking and acting on local systems from local perspectives. In our journey here, we've been very lucky to have the influence of Māori models of health and action, which are fundamentally systems oriented, such as Te Pai Mahutonga, which Sir Mason Jury talked about in his plenary session at the last IUHP conference in Rotorua. This groundswell appears to be happening internationally as well, as more sophisticated ways to think about ways to strengthen local systems are becoming more popular. There's some great work happening in the UK. The Wigan Borough Council has been working to change its relationship with its communities as a way of improving health. 
Uh, well, in Preston, they've been focusing on community wealth building um, with goals to retain local wealth and strengthen local assets. On the environment, cities around the world, including New Zealand, are trying to implement a downscaled version of Kate Rayworth's donut to keep local policy decisions mindful of our planetary constraints. And I think we need to watch the space around the degrowth movement, which recently for the first time was mentioned in an intergovernmental panel on climate change report. And what all this illustrates to me is that it's not only policy topics that need our attention, but how policy is done, how the policy system itself can support and grow the spread of local system strengthening. And we have some real opportunity to make progress here in New Zealand. We currently have a government with a strong commitment to our founding document, the treaty, um, and that also recognizes the false dichotomy in choices um, involving the economy and health. Our ability to stave off the worst health and economic consequences of the pandemic so far has been a large part because we prioritize investment in people. In 2019, wellbeing became a national budget driver alongside GDP. So I'm always a little bit weary of um, easy to see sort of big system levers and their habit of still bypassing local communities. But I have seen a glimmer of hope um, with the wellbeing budget where local businesses and other organizations have as a result of this national focus um, been adopting wellbeing as a measure of success for themselves. And I feel hopeful uh, seeing that we're constructing our well-being measures to encompass both human and non-human relationships. We're also seeing some energy here from local government. Somewhere along the way, our local government sector lost its interest in health and well-being and real community participation. But current activities in a sector review suggest we might be making progress on these, including um, supporting opportunities for Māori co-governance. And we have the most substantial reform of our health system in decades going on, as well as establishing a Māori health authority with potential for some decision-making clout. We're aiming to shift power closer to communities by setting up what are to be called localities. The potential of these localities to be a transformational space lies in them being more than only networks of providers and instead a place for strengthening local systems through real power sharing, which also links evidence with community needs and local governance structures. So our biggest challenge to achieving better and fairer health outcomes is not a lack of evidence or even necessarily political and policy intention, but understanding the problem more fully and therefore the how, how to effectively strengthen local community systems. We've so far failed to recognize in health policy and also welfare, I think, the sophisticated systems and structures that exist at the local level, the space where belonging, trust, norms and power are experienced, where people interact with their environments. Extraction is far either easier for governments. It's easier to take away control and resources than to give them back. Giving back power and agency requires conscious, innovative and frequently difficult action, but this is what needs to be done. Policy and community relationships for health and equity require a reciprocal and negotiated exchange of knowledge and resources. This is real partnership and real power sharing. To do this, policy organizations need to look inwards at their own cultures and behaviors to provide the stewardship that's needed. The policy system is the biggest tool that we have to seed and foster transformation. To be effective, it needs to embody a system that can learn, adapt and respond. I'm reminded of the important work of Professor Penelope Hoare, where she describes health intervention as an event within a system. I think the whole policy system itself needs to be considered such an event. The relational space close to communities where all the intersections and compounding of outcomes occurs needs greater attention, not least because of its disproportionate potential to influence what the system will look like in the long term. If well supported and equipped, community agency can be the flutter that leads to a healthier future. 
Our solutions, including public health ones, can not only be focused on more control and extraction, the same processes that are causing the climate crisis are causing the reproduction of health inequalities. Potential fixes that still leave local communities with no agency, nothing returned, no richness and intimacy restored will not achieve what's necessary. Without tackling our underlying systems and reversing their flows, we'll continue to have the outcomes we're currently seeing. If policy is our biggest tool for intentional social change, let's make it better and fit for purpose. Our well-being depends on it. Well, this is what I have been teaching my health policy students in any case. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Anna, for this presentation and giving us the experience in New Zealand and the work that you've been involved in and discussing that interface between policy and community and how to think about that from a systems perspective. Thank you very much. And especially since it's so early in the morning for you. Well, we've had two dynamic speakers. We've had imagery. And now it's your opportunity to raise questions of our speakers or make your own observations using the question and answer section on the platform and gives us a chance for speakers to respond. I'm delighted to tell you that Collectivo Latesis was finally able to join us and they're online. So when we go to the discussion, please feel free to ask them questions with the images that you saw and experience that you may have for them. But Cindy, would you please join me on the stage? So we'll give you a chance. I'm looking at the questions coming in. First question coming in. After naming, don't think of an elephant. Would you say that it's better to fight bureaucracy from the inside or the outside in terms of policy change? Ooh, that's a good one. Well, I would say both. Um, one of the things I think is important though is when you have a government that is clearly choosing not to implement the solutions, then it's more likely that you'll need to have a government uh, that's pressured from external forces into doing that. I remember one of the great teachers actually was a maintenance man in India. And uh, he taught me that really governments don't create change, they respond to change in big systemic issues. So that's why we have to change the culture in which a government exists to apply the pressure to do it. What you can do on the inside is write the truth. You know, when I was looking at all the disclosure mm -hmm. from the government in this court case, we had 120,000 of their documents. And inside, we revealed that all these people and professionals and experts were coming to the government complaining about the unequal funding and how it was harming children. But the first response from the government was to defend itself. No one took the time mm -hmm. to think, ah, sh let's think about this. Is mm -hmm. this really right? And if it's right, that's horrible. We got to fix it. So when you're on the inside of government and you get a critique, analyze it. Do right instead of trying to be right and defend right off the bat. Okay. All right. Um, another question that came in is, what is the economic measurement you are using to calculate well-being budget? What specific tools is one talking about? And actually, how do you define well-being in, in a budget analysis? Can anyone I respond? Guessing. <laughs> I'm guessing that's for me. Um, and that's a, very, that's a very big question. Um, uh, 
so, so, so one of the things when it was 2019, when, when the government decided that it was going to implement the wellbeing budget, one of the things which it did alongside that was begin to think about what they meant by wellbeing. And so there's been a whole lot of work thinking about um, uh, you know, what are the measures and what data is going to be needed to be able to um, uh, account for those measures. And um, uh, yeah, so, so it, it, the, and that question of, you know, what is, what, what is, what is the definition of well-being? I think that um, in, in New Zealand, um, there's a bunch of things. I think they're looking at environment, um, uh, human health, um, uh, uh, climate stuff. So they're, so they're being very broad in how they're thinking about well-being. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we do have two members from Colectivo on the line. Perhaps I'll give you a chance. Any comments you'd like to make to the participants? We've looked at your videos. Uh, yes, we thought actually that we were going to address the videos after Anna, but apparently it didn't happen. We have a mix up with the time changes because yes. the hour the time changed in the different countries. So we had it noted at one time and then it became earlier. And so that's why we made this mistake. We're very sorry for this. Now, if we can just address maybe a few minutes. Yes, of please. The, to give a little context to the videos, but we will switch to Spanish, is okay? There is translation. Okay, perfect. Dale comenta nomás. So I'll let you comment. So welcome to everyone. We are the Colectivo Las Dices from Valparaiso in Chile. And we're an artistic, feminist, interdisciplinary, trans-feminist collective. And we're also trans-intersectional. And we work on the translation of theoretical texts into performances. And these performances also work on the basis of various disciplines. So we work in visual and sound and dramaturgical aspects. And it's all based on the body. And we've been doing this type of work since 2018, the videos that you saw our work that we've produced in 2020 within this context of the global pandemic. And these works fundamentally have an important uh, work that we've done collectively, the power of bringing people together, women together, and people from the LGBT community and others as well, so that we can work together in the public space and work on certain relevant themes that are also related to feminism. So we are based in Valparaiso and we've also organized workshops and we've written two uh, books, uh, an anthology, which is a compilation of various texts. And these are texts that are drawn from literature and also from arts and from feminist authors. Not all of the authors are feminists. And we wish to give a feminist reading in our overall position so that we can change the patriarchal reality. So that's a big outline about the work of our collective. At the moment, we're down in Valparaiso. And Sibila, would you like to continue? So it's important to understand the context and our viewpoint about a work which is artistic, but also a work of activists. And we've got a feminist perspective, as has been said, a trans feminist and uh, 
a decolonialization perspective and with the uh, themes of this conference, we want to decolonize certain themes that are related to public policies and related to health and thus performance for us is a decolonializing tool. We understand performance as an action based on our bodies and there's Yana Taylor, a researcher, who has said that this is also a form of being able to transmit certain types of knowledge. It's a methodology and it's epistemology and it's a way of transmitting knowledge in a way which doesn't fit into the normal uh, categories. It's a uh, depository based in our body and we want to speak out of about certain policies and we want to take up themes related to sexual health and reproductive rights. That is a battle that we're waging in our country and also in the US. This has unfortunately come up once again and also many other countries, for example, the right to abortion. So we believe that it's fundamental to understand these performances as a mechanism for uh, transmission and a tool for resistance. And through our bodies, we can refer to these problems, these issues, these rights, and also these acts of violence such as sexual violence or domestic violence that has affected our bodies. And with our bodies, we can reclaim our rights and reclaim uh, reparation, redress policies with this decolonizing perspective by taking a different path. And we also want to be a, a depolitical activist rather than pursuing politics. We want to be depolitical. We want to draw a difference between institutional politics and policies and the policies that come up from the grassroots those who want to actually move into these uh, fields of power and politics. So the performance has to be understood as a tool and also the videos are a tool. We've got the we've got performances in public spaces and then we've got performance videos and that is our uh, strategy for making our uh, claims. We've got a feminist battle but also a decolonization battle. And we're also analysing repertories and uh, performances with a decolonial uh, perspective. We want to have a depository which is pre-colonial, but we also want to resist these hemogenic uh, canons uh, that always rely on archives rather than repositories. Another fundamental point is the question of appropriation of public spaces by uh, women and non-heterosexual communities and queers. We want to appropriate this public space that we've often been denied and where it's dangerous to appear and be present, but we want to have this forced appearance almost in this uh, space and that gives us uh, voices that have been silenced in the uh, past with colonialism and we want to express our expectations for the uh, current uh, situation within our own uh, region and what we're going through just uh, outside of our homes. So there's this exercise of reappropriation and we want to exercise politics through our uh, body. It's heterogeneous, not homogeneous, because we have this intersectional approach. And we want to have other forms of a policy which moves away from these hegemonic uh, uh, politics which we find with institutional politics and public policy. So there's a reappropriation exercise. We want to uh, claim this right to appear and fight for our rights, our health rights, our sexual health rights and our reproductive rights and also many other uh, demands uh, based on the uh, uh, feminist battle as well as the general social societal battle. We've got a few minutes left. 
Um, before I pass it back to the other speakers, you do have one question that came in, if you could answer that quickly. And the question simply was, how has your mobilization on the streets influenced policy changes in the new constitution of Chile? We don't know if it's our mobilization in particular, but it's the feminist movements in general in Chile that have had an influence and they've certainly had an impact as of 2018 up until now in terms of public uh, policies and also from a socio-cultural point of view because the feminist battle on our territory and other places is not just related to public policies but also uh, the cultural and social and political influence and we've seen that one of these impacts is that there's been a greater feminist revolt in our uh, territory and this then was linked up with the social uprising in 2019 that also took a feminist perspective because the demands are very much based in feminism and that was then translated in a way of drawing up the new constitution that was faced by a committee that was based on a parity with indigenous peoples who and others who were historically excluded, that were just exploited and killed and murdered, and that continues to be the case. But now in the constitution, there is a feminist And we have insisted to uh, be there, for example, also with the rights to abortion to be enshrined in the Constitution. I think it just disappeared. Um, the question that is before me, no, we've talked about budget already. What an amazing work uh, is one of the participants is commenting on. And she's asking for, um, could we have an example of policies that emerge from some of the grassroots work that you've been involved in? Anna, and it also will go back to you, Cindy. Um, so, so oh, there's a bunch of things. I mean, so one of the areas of policy that those teams involved in the Community Health Initiative have been um, successful at changing is local, uh, like local government policies, particularly around smoking. Um, there's been a, they've contributed to quite a groundswell around um, trying to get uh, better uh, alcohol policies and better alcohol regulation that fits with what um, local communities want. And that's currently going on at the moment. Um, yeah, so, so those kinds of, those kinds of, uh, so there's been quite a lot of change in those kinds of really localized um, policies. Um, yeah, but, but they've also, um, as a, as a, because there's these 10 teams around the whole country and, you know, as a sort of a movement and a group and a voice, you know, they've, they've put a lot of pressure on our Ministry of Health around um, contracting and around um, that kind of, um, uh, and, and our, 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 our reg big regulations as well. So, yes, so that's probably enough examples <laughs> for this early in the morning for me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cindy? Yeah, a couple of things on the well-being indicators. One of the things we realized is that the determinants of health are really Western-focused and not really nested in Indigenous worldviews. Mm -hmm. So we've worked with the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy to go around to First Nations knowledge keepers, elders. We created our own system of measuring to thrive. Because the question isn't, how much does it cost to fund child welfare? The question is, how much does it cost for First Nations children for the first time in the history of this country to thrive? Wow. And then it allows individual communities to curate a list of those well-being indicators that meet their needs and indeed to add in their own culturally based indicators and drive the money towards that. And when I talk about the change piece, what we've got is the first time in 30 years First Nations families have actually got services to keep themselves safely together than very being separated. And so that's just rolling out now in the billions of dollars. But I want to be really clear. The case that we have will not resolve all the inequalities. Things like water continue to be a dream for First Nations children. 
things like uh, just having self-government and that type of thing affirmed continue to be a dream for First Nations children. So we need to press for these policy change and not allow the public to think, oh, well, it's all fixed. Um, and I see at the bottom kind of how do you make sure that you're doing the work for the community and really in their voice. And one of the things I think is really important is to work on the basis of authority and not power. Power is asserted and authority is given. And that means we always need to be out there listening and learning and being accountable to those community members to make sure that we're actually doing the right thing. Wow. We have one last question before our time clicks off and it's for all of you as speakers. And the question is, how can we make sure that the voices we amplify in the public space is the true voice of the people who need it. How do we do that? Who wants to go first? I'll go first because I think mine's probably a bit more, uh, might be more technical in this. <laughs> Just certainly from um, what I've learned, um, you know, in, in being part of this, um, uh, this community health capacity um, initiative, capacity building initiative, is, um, you know, is, is that we have lots of methods, you know, like co-design methods, like um, methods of, um, you know, really, you know, getting in there amongst the people and insight gathering and, um, you know, having sort of quite systematic ways to really um, gather voice um, you know, and, and to make sure that, um, you know, people aren't missed and or groups aren't missed. Um, yes, yeah, so, so that's all that's all I'll say and I can let others talk. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to hold you for last, Cindy, since you're here. Collectivo colleagues, any comment? How can you make sure that the voices you've been amplifying in the public space are the true voice of the people who need it? Primero considerar... Well, we're not amplifying the voices of other people, but we're uh, amplifying voices in a collective and collaborative way uh, from a decolonial feminist perspective. We're not replicating a colonial logic. We don't want to represent other people. And there's never, I guarantee, but we have our political uh, commitment and we just think it's necessary to do this. And then what happens afterwards? Well, that's in the hands of others, and it just depends on our persistence and our uh, perseverance. And we've had lots of governmental uh, persecution, but we hope that with these changes that are underway in uh, Chile, things will change for the better. It's important to, to realize that we don't have to speak for people, that we create spaces where they speak for themselves. And so with our work with children, we've actually engaged children of all diversities to have voice directly with decision makers. Like we brought children to the UN Com Committee on the Rights of the Child to say their stories in their own voice. So why send someone like me when we could send the kids themselves? These are the types of things that we need to do, is do work with community while uplifting community, but not do work for community. Because when you're doing that, then too often what we're doing is taking up space. Thank you, ladies, for getting us started in the conference. You've laid down a challenge from all that follow you. Courage, sacrifice, authority, community, activism. You've given the words, and now our challenge is to see how we make them happen. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Avant de vous laisser aller, on aurait. Before we let you leave, we've got some important messages to share with you before you go off to the numerous sessions to which you have access today. So I'd like to repeat that if you need any technical assistance or if you need to communicate with the Secretariat at any moment in time when the platform is open up until the 26th of May, you're able to do that via the icon that you will find at the bottom left on the platform.
and in the virtual rooms where the sessions are going to take place you'll also have access to volunteers who will be able to give you technical support so we're really trying to pull out all of the stops to ensure that we can avoid the sorts of technical issues that's come up with virtual experiences. We want to ensure that doesn't have an impact on your virtual experience. If you really want to enjoy fully this virtual experience that we're offering to you, you can network with colleagues with these networking sessions that are identified as such in the programme. And if you haven't already done it, please do fill out your profile in the Delegates Hub so that you can have direct discussions with your colleagues via the platform. So this morning, we have two other blocks of sessions which will then be followed by a sub-plenary and you've got five choices of sub-plenaries. Then afterwards, we've got four other blocks of sessions that will stretch up to 8 p.m. Montreal time. So as we said this morning with Irma, there's many many different uh, types of interesting material in the programme. So you can create your own favourite list, your own favourite programme. So when you go through the general programme, you can click on the little heart that's on the right. Then you can just consult afterwards your own pre-selected programme. There's also the posters and the pre-recorded videos, rooms which are open. They've been open since the platform opened up and they'll also be available to the 26th of May. So do consult these. There's lots of really interesting material in there and vote for your favourite poster. That's quite a challenge. But you can vote up until Wednesday, 3pm Montreal time. And on Thursday, there will be a prize that will be awarded for the best poster. So in the resources tab, you'll also find complementary uh, documents which are being provided by the IUHP and that are related to the conference. And there's also complementary documents that have been provided by partners. And we'd like to recall that there's a consortium of partners behind this, such as the uh, Public Health School of the University de Montréal and the uh, the, the SUSE for the centre and south of the island of Montreal and the Centre Hospitalier of the University of Montreal and the Centre Hospitalier of Saint Justine as well as the Health and Social Services Network. And you can find the full list of all of our partners and uh, the sponsors that's on this tab. And if you need to have accreditation for your uh, studies, you can get all the information on this tab to get accredited for attending the conference. And if you want to participate, then you can click the IUHP 2022 on Twitter so that you can really participate and share your impressions so far and make sure that this conference is a really dynamic one. So have a great day and we'll see you again tomorrow morning at 7.50am for our morning coffee chat together. Thank you very much. Have a great day.